Yuan. Welcome, Chris Martin. How Thank are you very you, much. Friend? I'm good. The fourth, I assume, right? Yeah, I'm the sixth, sixth generation. Sixth generation. But I'm CF the fourth. I don't know what happened to the other two CFs. But, oh, that is so yeah. funny. Well, uh, thanks for coming out. This is our continuing master class series here at Montgomery County Community College. And we're very thankful for you to come over and share some Short of your... Commute. Yep, short commute. You're in Nazareth, PA. Yep. yep. Uh, about a, about a less than an hour from here, I would yeah, imagine. Yeah, a little more. Okay. But not that much more. Not much more. No. So we certainly suggest we'll be talking about the, the uh, factory as we yeah. move along for yeah. today. But um, I would love you to start, and if you could just give us some history. All, half of these people in here have played, touched, uh, heard, okay. and everyone has heard a Martin guitar. All right. All right. So... How much, time, how much time do we have? Yeah, only two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a long story. Um, and you really should come up and visit because you'll, you'll get to see the guitars being made and we have a museum. And I give, I'll, I give this talk in the museum. Right. And there I've got props and I can point to a guitar as I'm talking. So we're going to have to use our imagination. Um, the guitar, historians have traced something like the guitar back to Mesopotamia. Hmm. And it, it, over time, over a couple thousand years, worked its way up into Northern Europe. The irony, I think, about the fact that, you know, historians say that something with a resonant body and a neck with frets and vibrating strings was created in Mesopotamia. There are people in Mesopotamia today that don't want us to make music. And they invented the damn thing. Oh, that's so crazy. Isn't it crazy? That is crazy. Okay, so it works its way up into Northern Europe, and it goes through all these iterations. Right. The lute, the vihuela, how many strings should it have? Ten, four, eight, six, twelve. The twelve-string guitar predates the six-string guitar. Wow. By the late 17, early 1800s, guitar builders and guitar players had settled on something that when we would look at it today, we'd go, yes, I recognize that. Six strings. 12 fret body, small bodies, little right. guitars. So my great, great, great grandfather as a young man apprenticed with his father in what was then my family's business in a small town called Marknerkirchen, which is kind of between Munich and Prague, of making furniture. But he took an interest in the guitar, that we know. In his town, they also made musical instruments for distribution. And they made a lot of violins. In fact, I got a chance to go. Um, Mark Nekirchen was, was part of East Germany. Hmm. So I'm kind of glad my right. great-great-grandfather got out of there. Bef right. Before I was growing up, I would have grown up in East Germany. And they had a museum. So we go in the museum, and two funny things. Uh, first of all, the, the director of the museum showing me this piece of linen that they had framed. And it had names printed on it. And I'm looking at it, and I started to laugh. He goes, yeah. So when you go to a flea market, and you pick up a violin at the flea market and you look inside and you go, oh my God, it's a Stradivarius. Right. No, right. it was made in Mark Nekirchen. Wow. Because they had Stradivarius and Amadi and Guanari. He said, we'd take scissors and we would cut the linen out, glue it on the back of the violin, and nobody cared. Oh my goodness. Yeah. The other thing is, I said to him, I said, all right, here I am at your museum presenting, the wall had come down, presenting you with a Martin D28. Why? wasn't there something in the museum to acknowledge my great-great-great-grandfather? He said, oh, we knew all about him. I said, well, so answer my question. Right. Why, was, why are you now, after the walls come down, why are you finally now acknowledging his existence? He said, because it was illegal. I said, what was illegal? He said, it was illegal to acknowledge the existence of anyone who ever left East Germany. I said, he left in 1833. He said, didn't matter. The government did not want people to think you could leave. Wow. So I thought it was pretty interesting. Wow. Okay, so he shows an interest in the guitar. His father says, go ask the violin makers if they'll teach you how to build a guitar. And they were very dismissive of the guitar. Ah, it's a folk instrument. It's not an orchestral instrument. Mm -hmm. Don't bother. So his father got him a job in Vienna. At the age of 15, he moved to Vienna and worked with a fellow named Johann Stauffer. So Mr. Stauffer is historically known as the father of what's called the Viennese School of Guitar Design. And the only really remaining design element of that Stauffer instruments, which we have on display, if you come, when you come to visit, the first display case in the museum shows Stauffer guitars made by CF. It had a particular, I call it kind of a curly Q headstock. 
And I am convinced that Leo Fender was inspired by the Stauffer headstock, because hmm. if you look at a Stauffer headstock and you look at a Fender headstock. Especially early on, right? Yeah, yeah. very similar. So he worked there for several years, learned how to build guitars in the Stauffer style, formed a partnership briefly with an older co-worker. They split off, married that gentleman's daughter, had a son, dissolved the partnership, came back to Mark Nekirchen. He's going to hang out his shingle. He rolls back into town, and while he was away, the violin makers had gotten into the guitar business. Because oh. they saw there was demand. Mm -hmm. So they said to him, and this is still the law today in Germany, if you want to build guitars, you have to apprentice. And he said, well, that's why I went to Austria. And they said, Austria is another country. Germany has this law, which they're talking about modifying, that if you want to practice a trade or a craft, you must go through this long, arduous apprenticeship. And they said, you did that for furniture. You didn't do it for musical instruments in Germany. Hmm. So we think that and the fact that we do know he was corresponding with some fellow German immigrants from that lower Saxony area who had already emigrated to the New World. And we believe they said, look, don't worry about it. Get on a boat and come over here. There's opportunity. Mm -hmm. So in the fall of 1833, he grabbed his worldly possessions, including, we think, some guitars, family. Now he's got a son and daughter. His wife gets up to Bremen, sails across the Atlantic, and comes to Manhattan. And if you go to lower Manhattan and you're coming back to Pennsylvania, you're going down Hudson Street, right before you peel off to go into the Holland Tunnel, it's now the 200 block. He rented a building, a uh, storefront, and lived upstairs at 196 Hudson Street. On the hmm. corner of that long, block-long office building now is a bronze plaque oh. that says, in this block was the location of the first Martin Guitar Workshop in America. Wow. Yeah. So he... I go by that all the time. All right, next. It's not big. It's about I'm this sure. big. So he puts a guitar in the window. It was a music store. He sold guitars. He did repairs, sold violins, sold violin strings, lived upstairs. New York was pretty rough and tumble back then. And even though the business was good, my feeling is Mrs. Martin was not happy. They, were, they must have come out to the Lehigh Valley. And what did they find? Yeah. A transplanted German immigrant community. Right. People spoke German, cooked German food. Holiday time, it was just like the, the old world. So in 1839, they moved to Nazareth, sort of, kind of. Nazareth was still a closed religious commune founded by the Moravians. Mm -hmm. And if you were not born and bred Moravian, you couldn't live in Nazareth. Moravians were very commercial, but at night, it, very insular. So they bought a piece of property on Cherry Hill, above the factory we're in today. And then in 1850, 1858 or whatever, um, the town incorporated itself, and they, they moved into town. We still have the family's ancestral homestead in the old factory. Something happened along the way, and I've given this talk all my life, and I, I continue to learn new things. And a couple of years ago, a bunch of guitar scholars came to visit, and they said, can we have access to your collection and your archives? We want to answer a question. And I said, sure. And Dick Boak helped to, to organize this, and they wrote a book. And then they had an exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in conjunction with the publication of the book. So in the second display in the museum, you see a dramatic transformation of the guitar itself. And the premise that these scholars concluded was that CF must have come to the realization that this quirky, stouffer looking guitar was a tough sell. What people saw in their mind was a traditional Spanish classic guitar. And at nylon, that, basically. Well, gut. Right. But right, yes, gut, nylon right. after World War II, thanks right. to DuPont. Right, yeah. right. So what was happening was, at that time, the, the, the Spanish builders were located in Cadiz. They had not yet moved up to Madrid. And Cadiz is one of the oldest cities in Europe, hot and humid every day. But they wanted to export these things. They didn't travel well. They'd get them cross the Atlantic, come to New York or Philly or Boston, and they didn't survive a winter. Mm -hmm. And we believe CF said, wait a minute, I can build those. And he was a master mm -hmm. luthier, right. he was a cabinet maker, and he built them where they were going to live. And they didn't fall apart. Mm -hmm. And that solidified his reputation as, okay, these things aren't cheap, but they're durable. They work. Mm -hmm. And in conjunction, and when you see the, the ones we have on display, you're like, if I didn't know that was a Martin, I would swear it came from Spain. 
I mean, that soup to nuts, he knocked them off. Right, in your museum, yeah. I saw that one guitar. Right? It does look like a Soup train. to nuts. Right. The other thing that happened, and it happened over time, is the development of what we call X bracing, which is an integral part today of how a Martin guitar top is braced. Now, there's different opinions. Which makes it, makes, makes, contributes to its sound, right. I would imagine, right? And, and the durability. But and the durability. Right? What, what you're trying to do when you're building an acoustic guitar, very different than an electric, what I like to say is there's, there's a place where the sound lives. Now, you want to build it durably, particularly if you're spending a lot of money, you want it to last, and anyone can overbuild a guitar. That's easy. But the more you overbuild it, the more you lose the sound. You're building for durability, not tone. You come over here, and a, and a really good example of taking this to the extreme is the, is the flamenco guitar. Flamenco guitars are built so delicately that they often have to be rebuilt during their lifetime. But what we've managed to do is find that sweet spot consistently where they're durable enough and they make a great sound because you're, you're building the guitar, it's, it's, it really wants to pull itself apart. Mm -hmm. That's where the sound is, mm -hmm. but you don't want it to pull itself apart. So he's using fan bracing, which is what the Spaniards used, and he's making pin bridge guitars. Tie bridge guitar, no problem, right? Tie strings on the bridge, like a traditional classic guitar, no problem. Pin bridge, you're drilling a hole through the top, you know, put the, the string with a little ferrule inside, put the pin in, that we think the scholars said what was happening because back then you did a lot of eyeballing right. when you're building the guitar, that he may have been drilling through these braces and became very frustrated. Oh, now i got to take the guitar apart. So he began to move them out of the way, and over a period of a couple of years, came up with this thing where he just said, wait a minute, if I crisscross these braces, interlock them, I'll give just enough support and still allow that Be top from the... to move. Right. And the, you know, the, the top of the guitar, it's the speaker. Right. That's, you don't, we don't see it move, right. but that, it's moving. It's the resonator. Exactly. And then the, the back and sides are like the speaker cabinet. They color, and the woods on the back and sides color the sound. Speaking of wood, yep. you now that's obviously the biggest um, uh, challenge getting the right, because wood's wood. It's not consistent. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be like this every time it yeah. rolls off yep. the, the line. Yep. So what's the challenges, and did, has it evolved over the years with the wood? Because I you know, when, about you, and, when, when you look at the traditional woods, they have been used to make acoustic guitars as long as we've been in business and before. Rosewood, mahogany, Spanish cedar, spruce, ebony, very traditional. And yet, think about it, in Europe or even in America, getting those logs in the 1800s out of Brazil mm. on a boat, <laughs> right. up to up a, a song, first of all, down a river, down a river probably, onto a, on a boat. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, then when you cut wood for lumber, you, you do what's called slab cutting. And it's very efficient, and it utilizes the, the, the tree uh, in a very efficient way. But those boards have a tendency to warp because of the grain orientation. But building a house, you know, you put a bunch of them together, and you put some drywall up, no one's going to see it. For a guitar, you take a tree, and you cut it in half, and then you cut that half in half. And then what I like to say, now you've got a, like a piece of pizza, right? Mm -hmm. Then you, you take that first bite, my friend of mine calls the filet mignon bite. Mm -hmm. You take that off and that leaves a flat spot. So here's the pizza, right? There's the bark. You take, you've got this flat spot. You set that down on the saw carriage and then you slice through and through. That's how you get the grain orientation to correct, look. called quarter sawing. And then you split them open, you get that book match. That wood's not going anywhere. When you quarter saw properly, the wood is, it's gonna stay. That's it. So you're not, tops aren't warping, backs aren't warping. Um, then you've got to get the proper veneer thickness and then the finish and finishing there's a lot of controversy about particularly modern finishes what do they do they're very durable it's to, in my mind it's more about how much finish just enough mm -hmm. just enough to be protective to enhance the beauty of the wood and then stop right now i noticed in your factory and again you know i highly recommend going you know, we had a great tour and that was amazing um uh, I noticed, one, that the temperature was extremely controlled, yep. and in that one room it was just crazily perfect. Yep. And I also noticed that you're still doing a lot by hand, mm -hmm. even though there are some... I, I, I likened it after, my, after I left, I thought that was the best combination... Finally, it works. I thought it was the best combination that, uh, of it being the, the, the 
blend of old world artisanship and like robots. Yeah. Right. Yep. Explain to me like why why where you're still keeping people in. Yeah. Well, automation. let's let's go all the way back again. Sure. You know, once the the business got to a point where CF said, I can't keep up with the demand, he started hiring help. And from that point on, I believe, and, and you, you can see that in the factory today, I really think he began to divide up the work. It's easier to teach someone to build part of a guitar than the entire guitar. Right, that makes sense. He knew how to build the entire guitar, but it's like, look, you build the body, you build the neck, you do the finishing. And we always used machines. We've always used tooling and fixturing. That's, that's how you make more than one, even to make one guitar. Right. You've got to have right. the thing that you know, holds it together while you're, while you're putting it together. And no one, even in Asia, no one has invented the guitar put it together machine. Right. Right. So right. You know, where there are opportunities, like particularly when we make the parts, the parts are consistent, and, and, and you want to make them in massive quantities, bridges. You right. want to make them, sure. the old way was, the old way with a machine was called a shaper. And that thing, that little scary, mm -hmm. big hunking razor blades spinning. Some like, of the operators missing a finger. You know, right. you really had to be careful. Right. And and it was a it was a multi multi stage operation where you would you'd set your right proper blade up, you'd get your fixture, you'd put your bridge blank in, and you'd make a pass. Then you would have to check right. how did I set it up? And you'd take your calipers out, tweak it a little bit, maybe okay, I'm good. So then you would do that a hundred times, one shape. Now I've got to put another shape on the back side of this blank. I've got to put a different blade in. Right, right, right. Got to flip it around in the fixture, maybe a new fixture, checking what we do. And I have to give Bob Taylor credit for this. Bob had his vocational technical background. And he realized when he was in Votech, he's looking at these CNC machines going, if that thing can cut metal, it can cut wood. And we were still using draw knives and, and shapers. What, what the CNC does all right, is you teach the machine to do all of those operations on the bridge blank in a sequence. And there's a rotating tool head. So you mount that bridge blank on a vacuum press and you say, first step, this tool comes down and do this. Right, right. So it eliminated all that tear down and set up. I saw that. I see, yeah. yeah. The, the one area where the robots, you probably didn't get to see, maybe you did, ha has really had two benefits is in finishing. Finishing can be very art artisanal. Right. And we would often hire, in this case, mostly men who had worked in automobile repair huh. because they knew how to spray. Right. But what we would find is they were artists. Well, I hold my gun like this. And we'd hire someone else. Well, I hold my, and so we didn't have consistency. They were all good, but every one of them did it a different way. Right. Plus the finishes are, they're noxious. So once we realize that a robot can do it the same way and we remove our valued coworkers from this noxious environment, right. that, that really right. worked out it was right. a double benefit. Of, we got consistency and people weren't inhaling these noxious I saw fumes. that they were still doing like cutting the mother of pearl and all that stuff, like taking off some of the finish. The, it yeah, there's, like it there's, there's, there's things the that it's so delicate right. that e either the, uh, to, to develop a robot for that would be ridiculously prohibitively expensive. Right. Or it's, the technology is not there so yet. Not but there. we're using more vision. We've got some... some uh, very sophisticated tooling and fixturing now that actually uses vision mm -hmm. and, and, and can look, you know. It can actually look at it. It looks at it and it knows in the brain of the computer, the image just says, yep, that's what I'm looking for. Let it go. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. Uh, I teach uh, evolution of music technology and one of, the, one of the sections that we talk about is uh, the introduction of the dreadnought and mm -hmm. how the need for a louder guitar yeah. from the big bands and all. Could yeah. you talk to us about that? Because sure. I'm sure I didn't explain it nearly as well. <laughs> so what we think, and I, I got a, a good dose of this. I was in uh, Hawaii last week, and I hooked up with a gentleman who's a vintage guitar repairman and a Hawaiian music buff. I mean, crazy about Hawaiian music. And what we think was that 
there was a gentleman named Major Kilikai, and he said Major Kilikai was classically trained, and he had a band, and they used Martin guitar. So I didn't realize, he said, Chris, certainly everyone knows about Martin ukuleles and their connection to Hawaii. What most people don't know is that the Martin guitar was as important for Hawaiian musicians to play for money to tourists. People came all this way in the evening. They want to hear some music. Right. So Major Kilikai, through our distributor Ditson, said, I need a bigger guitar. I need something with more oomph. There was no amplification. He said, right. Chris, there weren't even microphones. Right. No, there were, there were certainly no pickups, no microphones, no PA. It was the band playing in front of two or 300 tourists you know, in the evening. So we made him this one guitar, and we think that Ditson, our distributor, had a chain of music stores up and down the East Coast, said, there's something there. There's something there with that bigger guitar, bigger than the O, double O, triple O, which you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. And so it, the, we modified it slightly. We made some for them. They didn't sell very well because it was an odd duck. You know, it's really big, mm -hmm. and people just didn't. It's not a guitar you sit with. It's a standing guitar. Right. They didn't know what to make of it. Then Ditson went bust during the Great Depression. But we said, you know, something about that guitar, it's worth keeping in the line. We had the tooling, and then so instead of saying Ditson, we needed, the early ones didn't say Martin. They said Ditson. We put Martin on it. But it was still a 12-fret guitar because the guitars were going through this transition from 12 to 14 fret. And the, the Dreadnought actually, that happened to the Dreadnought after the triple O and the double O. And a fellow who was, he was doing okay during the Great Depression, Gene Autry. Gene Autry, right. He contacts, was the man who made it happen. Contacts him. us through a dealer. We have correspondence and says... You mean you, have, you still have the correspondence yeah. to this day, right? Not only do I want a Dreadnought, I want a Style 45. Okay. Top of the line. Right. So we make him this guitar and he's so enamored with it, he uses it in his movies. And... He influenced his singing cowboy peers. They're like, Gene, what the hell is that thing? Right. You gotta hear this. And they're like, I gotta get me one of them. Right, exactly. And even though George Gruen will say Gene Autry was not the most accomplished guitar player, as a brand ambassador, he, was, he hit a long ball right, out of the park. Exactly. He was, that's for sure. <laughs> and then you had Johnny Cash, who would never take a picture without it. Right. Yep. Like, it just it, it it certainly it has a sound but it has a presence. You know, when you see someone standing up on stage with a dreadnought, you're like, okay, right. I want to hear some music now. <laughs> All right, and speaking of that, yeah. you were, uh, we were fortunate enough to have an amazingly talented guitar player, Mr. Craig Thatcher. Let's give it up for Mr. Craig yeah. Thatcher. Well, thank you. And he is, um, well, why don't you, uh, Craig is, is sort of your guitar ambassador, so to speak. Is yeah, when, when I, you know, I travel around the world and, uh, I guess it's called Dog and Pony Show. Right. I give the talk. I'll talk for, you know, 40 minutes or so. And then I turn it over to a professional to, to show the audience what the heck the, the things I've been talking about can do. I, I love <laughs> when, I, when I first met you, you said, um, listen, I don't play guitar. So, yeah. you know, yeah. I have people who do that. We make yeah. them. That was pretty funny. <laughs> I enjoyed that. Hi, Craig. Hey. How you doing, buddy? I am extremely well. How about you? Good. Uh, we're very, um, well, we definitely want to hear some music, hear this beautiful Martin guitar. Sure. We took the liberty to kind of mic it up a little bit. Okay, and just for um, all the, um, just for all the um, audio nerds in the, um, in, the, in the audience, we have um, three mics I'm using. I'm using an AKG C12 that keeps drooping on the mic stand. And I'm also using a C1000 and a Gold 414. Basically, we're really just going to focus on the C1000 to get kind of the front of the microphone and then the C12 over the shoulder. Now, There's many different ways of miking a guitar, and there's, we're just choosing this way to do it. Uh, basically, my theory about guitars, especially acoustic, is um, when you pick up a guitar, there's two things that you enjoy about it, the way it feels and the way it sounds. 
Your neck doesn't magically grow and goes right into the front of the sound hole. It's actually sounding where it sounds to you naturally in your ears. So what I like doing is, is miking it over where your ears actually are and then still using the front to get a little bit more change or dynamic or a little bit of accent to the strum itself. So can I jump in? Sure. So when we are benchmarking, say our product against a competitor or our new product, we have a pool of very good guitar players who work at the factory and we do exactly what you just talked about. We have the individual player play for themselves. We call that under ear. Right. And then they will write up a report and then we have six people sit out in front of that person and right. the, that person plays for them. Right. So you get two very different perspectives right. on what, what's going on. Yeah, it's very important. And so, and you know, there's a lot of beautiful sound that comes up where your head, you know, because that's part of the way it sounds. And so you want to try to capture that as well. So, Craig. Yes, sir. Uh, why don't you uh, should, should close the door a little bit or no? How's the audio, by the way? Can you ask? Uh, it, it, he's getting everybody's, he's getting his voice and all that stuff. Okay, you good? I'm, I'm. Okay, good. Okay, here we go. All right, let me try to get a little bit of volume in here. What are you going to play for us there, Craig? Well, I thought I'd do a little drop D <coughs> tuning on this guitar, and I hope we have a, a chance to actually talk about the guitar just a little bit. Oh, we some... have a chance right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, well, this guitar is uh, my custom model, and it is a 4-0, or also known as an M size. So we have single, double, triple. There's also a 4-0. And this came out in the uh, late 70s okay when now. David Bromberg came up with uh, an old F-style archtop Martin guitar, and he asked, uh, I believe it was Matt Umanoff up in New York City, if they could put a flat top on that guitar. And once they did that, he then came down to Martin and said, hey, this is a guitar that you should have in your line. So it came about the size. So the depth is the same as the triple, single, or the double O. But the body size is more of a jumbo size. So we have a larger lower bout and larger upper bout. And up, what that does is it gives you a little bit more bass response than you'll get out of, say, a triple O. Now, triple O is my main guitar. I also have the long scale. Triple O scale is the short scale, which is 24.9. The long scale for Martin is 25.4. So single, double, and triple are going to have short scale, which gives you a little more, uh, uh, your fingering hand, it's a little easier on your finger hand. You can bend strings, a little lighter touch. The long scale will project more, so it's a tighter, makes for a tighter uh, uh, string, and it's going to project a bit more. So the, the 4.0 has the long scale as well. But this model, you might notice the sound hole. It's an enlarged sound hole. And this model is actually like a custom shop of the Yorma Kalkinen signature model, which also is an M size with a large sound hole. But I have uh, what's called wild grain rosewood on this, which is a gorgeous grain. It's an Adirondack spruce top, which is our stiffest tone wood, means it's got a lot of headroom. The more you dig in, the louder it gets. Um, we also have maple binding, and the herringbone inlay on this guitar is pearl. So it's a beautiful guitar. Underneath that X bracing has been shifted forward. We call that forward shifted bracing. So a little bit of the support underneath the bridge has been removed. And what that does is allows the top to vibrate more. And the bracing is also scalloped, which does the same thing. When you scallop the bracing, if you look at it from the side, it looks kind of like a suspension bridge. You're scooping out some wood from the middle of the brace. And what that does is, again, allows that top to vibrate. So we're always trying to have that X brace, which develops the support and the strength and, and actually distributes the tension on the, the, equally on the, bo on the body. But 
You build it too light, it's going to implode. You build it too heavy, it's not going to be able to move. So all these things, forward shifted bracing, scallop bracing, it all helps to allow this vibration. So I just want to talk about that. So you're going to hear that in this guitar, which has no pickups in it at all. This system, this particular guitar is my recording guitar. I only use this with a microphone. So I thought I'd do something from Yorma for you. on September 29th. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. The full band will be down here. The, the full band. I look forward to that. We'll do a, a partial uh, acoustic show and electric show for that. Well, that's, uh, we're all looking forward to that as well. So Thank that's you. Great. Thank you. All right, so let's hear something. Yeah. <laughs> Bet. You know, I like this drop D tuning. I think drop D really, really makes a Martin. It's pretty big, isn't it? How about some old blues here? Uh...
thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Big influence on um, on music. So now we hit the '60s. Yeah. So give us a little story about some of those great players that, that made again Martin yeah. famous, right? So I'm going to put a plug in for two books. Um, one is called Canyon of Dreams, and the other one I just picked up. Both focused primarily on what was going on in the '60s in Southern California, up, up in Laurel Canyon. Before that, and this a really good documentary out there about the, uh, the folk scene in Greenwich Village. Right. And that was where you went. Went right. to New York. Bob Dylan. Play right. acoustic guitar. Um, and, and I watched this documentary. And I, you know, one thing I said to myself, I said, man, I wish my dad was still alive. Because mm -hmm. he grew up during that. He, he was more of the folk generation than the folk rock generation. Right. But so what was the most fascinating thing about the documentary is they, you know they you talk about like the Kingston trio kind of feel good stuff right. but you know those folkies they would sing old political songs right. but not new ones and so they're 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 talking about the scene in Greenwich Village and in, in uh, Washington Square Park Sunday they would turn the fountain off and that was music and poetry day and people would just you know all the bridge and tunnel people and it yeah. just descended and everyone had you had a guitar or you listened to the guitar or you're reading your poetry or writing poetry so it's coming up to, you know, next Sunday, and they go down to the park, and there's these signs, you know, by order of the, you know, New York City, whatever, there will be no more music or poetry in the park. Okay, and I'm watching this documentary going, what? And they, so Izzy Young, he had the Folklore Center in Greenwich Village, and uh, this, they interviewed this guy. He said, I was going to NYU, and I was studying documentary filmmaking. So I heard that they were going to go down to the park, so I grabbed my camera. So he's got the footage. So we all gather at Izzy's store, and Izzy's like, we're going to go down there, and we're going to find out what the heck's going on. How, how dare they with the music? I can't make music. What are they all about? They get down there, and sure enough, there's like the mayor's lackey in a suit, and there's cops. And Izzy says, so what's the story? You saw the sign. What you're doing here is un-American, and we're going to stop it right now. He goes, it's un-American to sing songs and read poetry? That's a sign, no more. And Izzy goes, you're kidding. They go, and he looks at the cops, he goes, this is like we're kidding? So Izzy goes, all right. And he turns to the crowd that he brought, and he goes, we're just going to sing them one song. And he leads everyone in God Bless America as they load them into the paddy wagons and haul them away. And they said that was the tipping point where people realized that they had to use music to talk about current events, it's like the war in past. Vietnam, right, exactly. like discrimination. Right. And, and that, all of a sudden, the songs were much more currently political, right. and there wasn't so much Tom Dooley. Right. Okay. So then, the, the migration that occurred as the, 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 that folk rock generation ended up migrating to Southern California, because that's where they were producing the music. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the Allentown Art Museum a couple years ago, they had a, a show called Who Shot Rock and Roll? And they had a film it was that running continuously. And it was just like Super 8 movies of those folks having, and, they, and I said to myself, I said, man, I get it. They were all good looking. And in the books, in the Canyon of Dreams, and there's another book about that scene, the Laurel Canyon scene, they said they were all handsome right. and super talented. And so they, they start to, you know, create this music, and, and, they, and they, they all kind of lived communally up in Laurel yeah. Canyon. That's where our house came from. Right. David Crosby. Yep. And, and they talk about Mama Cass. Right. Saying to, um, um, still uh, Graham Nash, who was not happy with the Hollies. Right. But he, was, he could harmonize, because that's what the Hollies were all about. And, right. he was, and he said, he said, they didn't want to play my music. Right. And he was hanging out with Joni Mitchell, and Mama Cass said, when I call you, you come to my house. And she called him, and David Crosby and Stephen Stills were there. And Mama Cass goes, and, and so David, or um, Graham Nash says, they, whatever song, the first album had him come out. Yep. And he said, S -s play that song that Mama you know, Cass told me about. Play it again. And they're all like, 
how many times do we have to, and by the third time, he's singing along. And the three of them look at each other and go, we got a band. Right. But they, they talked about the birds, they talk about the, Chris Hillman with the Hillman, right. and how this thing just, and they said, and, and they, the music, the, the albums just took off like rockets. Right. Well, and it was indeed. It was definitely, and especially with the war and all that, yeah. it was just a, the, the right template. Yep. And we haven't yep. seen young people, to be honest, do that sort of I protest know. since then until now, recently, yep. with Parkland. I mean, that's yep. the first time I've seen like a, a, a major upswell of a yeah, young Now, what was the proportion. Occupy, remember, a couple of years ago, they were living in Manhattan, and, and even uh, right, David right, Crosby yes. showed up. Yes, that's I true. thought I that would see true. more guitars. Right. I, it's like, hey, this is, this is the moment. You saw sleeping. This is the moment, yeah. <laughs> now, what's going on today is, you know, there's, there's still a tremendous interest in more acoustic right now than electric. But there's, in our industry, we are concerned. I will, I will let you know that we are concerned that, not that there's anything wrong with EDM. Right. But they, they, at NAMM, they have these breakfasts. And uh, they always interview fascinating. Man, is the, is the, just for anybody who doesn't know, it's a big convention that all the manufacturers and all end up going, what, twice a year, basically? Yeah, the big ones in Anaheim, they had these educational breakfasts. And one year they, they interviewed Moby. And Joe Lamont said, he said, so tell us about it. And he said, well, you know, it's me somewhere up there with hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of gear by myself right. playing to 5,000 people. And I'm about making music. That's about listening to music. So there is a concern in the industry that, you know, if, if we all want to listen, but we all, we need more music makers. Right. And, you know, when you got one guy right. with all that gear, it's like, no, 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 there should be a lot of people. <laughs> so that, you know what's back now is the ukulele. Yeah. The ukulele is back with a vengeance. Right. And people, you know, YouTube has really fueled how, how easy and how much fun it is, and the ukulele is the gateway drug to the guitar. Yeah. That's great. I like that. Well, that sounds like a good way to end. I'll tell you right. that right now. That sounds great. Um, okay, so we're, any questions from anybody for, for Mr. Martin here? Because, uh, yes, Mark. Uh, I was just curious about, since you mentioned the ukulele, the yeah. Martin backpacker guitar. Ah, uh -huh, okay. Like, oh, tell us. Tell us the story of that, because yeah. that was an interesting, great, great, Mark. So my dad was one of the original funders of the Philadelphia Folk Festival. They came to him and they said, Frank, you know, we, we think we're onto something, but we don't have any money. So he wrote him a check. And so we've been participating with the Folk Festival right? forever. And so I- Were you getting the stereo? One the year, I went down, we, we would put a display up. So I'm there, and I'm and in the, the little craft area. I don't know if you've been there. I haven't been there. And I'm walking around the craft area. And in this one booth, this guy, this little scruffy, little hippie-looking guy, he's got these things called the strum stick. And I, I'm looking at him. It's, kinda, it's based on a dulcimer, a dulcimer fretboard. And he said, yeah, they're really easy to play. You basically just bar fret them. And in the back of his booth, he had something very similar to the strum stick with six strings. And I said, Bob, what is that? He said, I have friends who camp who play the guitar. So I took my strumstick design and made them that thing. I'm looking at it going, huh. And we had just opened a factory in Mexico, primarily, primarily to make strings. But I knew that at some point we were going to ask them to make guitars. And I know that making a traditional acoustic guitar is very difficult to start. So I'm looking at this thing and I said, so, and he says, can I tell you how I make it? I said, yeah, tell me how you make it. So he said, I, I come up to your factory. And I go over to that old factory where you sell all the reject wood. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, I buy, a, I buy a piece of mahogany that you didn't use to make a neck. Oh, okay. And I take some of the wood out of the bottom of that piece of mahogany, and that bottom piece becomes the bottom of the backpacker, and I splay the sides out. I go, huh. And then I buy a reject back, and that becomes the back of the backpacker. Huh. And then I buy a reject top, and that becomes the top of the backpacker. Huh. And then I buy a reject fingerboard, and I take the bottom of the fingerboard off, and I make the bridge. And by now, I'm going, I could do that. He goes, no, you can't. I have a patent, and I'll sue you. <laughs> I said, well, what if we partnered? He said, I'm game, because I can't make a lot of them, and I don't want to make a lot of them. So I said, come up and visit the factory. So I gather my colleagues. And Bob shows up, and he's got this little nylon Cordura bag. 
and he pulls it out and everybody's laughing. Ha ha ha, ha ha ha, isn't that funny? I said, Bob, tell me how you make it. So he goes through that whole litany and you can see everybody's the bubble in their heads going, we could make that. I said, Bob, tell them the punchline. You better not, I'm gonna sue you. And then I said, but Bob wants to make a deal. And so we said, all right, F first step, easy to make, but probably not going to sell many. We made the most rudimentary fixturing you have ever seen. I mean, we used like chipboard. And we said, if we sell 5,000 of these things over the lifetime of it, we should be fabulously satisfied. I've lost count, but it's well over 200,000 backpackers that we have made. Yeah. One went into space, right? Yep, a little one because of the size of the, of the locker. Yeah, and you know, they sound a little bit more like a banjo, but they are so durable, you can take them everywhere. One, I, one went up uh, Mount Everest. I actually have one. Right. I, I got one from the original, from Bob. Oh, Bob okay. All and right. it's set up, it's, uh, the, the, the tuning is like a, a scale. So it's so no matter where you hit, you can almost make it really work. Yeah. And it's not like a traditional guitar where it's a half step up. It's like in a mix. You have the, the strum stick. Strum stick. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that thing is really yeah. cool. And it is very banjo like, yeah. especially with a thin, thin string, yeah. and you, a yeah. thin pick. You yeah. can really make that wine. It's very yeah. cool. Yeah. Two, three strings. And so from there, then we started to make the HPL guitars in Mexico. Just recently, we've started making full-size, solid wood, full-gloss guitars. Took us 25 years. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the folks that are down there, they learned over time how to make a good guitar. I have a question. So with all this knowledge and experience in guitar building mixed with the technology that you use today, do you, do, do you, do you mainly service the acoustic industry specifically going like on the, the heritage kind of idea or are you thinking about developing new instruments or new kinds of acoustic instruments based on all of that? It's tough. Um, Henry Jeskowitz, who did a good job of buying Gibson, he hasn't done such a good job of preserving Gibson if you've read recently. Right. But Henry came in and said, I am going to take the Gibson guitar to the next level. And the market said, no, we're, we're quite happy with Les Pauls. Right. So that's a, a little bit of the blessing and the curse of Martin, mm -hmm. is that we have this rich history and heritage. I love to go to luthier shows where I see wild and crazy stuff. Whether that stuff ever really becomes commercialized or not, I don't know if I have that liberty to do that. Mm -hmm. That people might go, oh my God, he's gone crazy. We have to, it's a fine line. Now I did, I met a gentleman a year or two ago at a trade show and he said, Mr. Martin, I want to tell you about your company. I said, I think you're about to. <laughs> and he said, Martin Guitars has one foot planted firmly in the past. I'm like, thank you. And he said, and Martin Guitars has one foot planted firmly in the future. But it's a, it's a balancing act for us. Right. Okay. It really is. Can I follow up on that question, please? Yeah. I just want to make one comment. I own several Martin Guitars. <laughs> I'm one of your believers, right? My wife bought me the Veterans Edition which is a spectacular instrument. It's got all the logos of the different services on yep. it. It sounds great. Yep. I want to thank you personally for doing that. Yep. It's a fantastic instrument. The question I have is I also own a performing artist edition, mm -hmm. which is another gorgeous guitar. Yep. This has pickups on it because you're talking about electronics. Yep. But it actually blends. You can blend it to make different sounds come out of it yep. based on taking it into a studio and using several different microphones mm -hmm. that's now built into the guitar. Yep. Do you plan on pursuing that avenue or? We have a really good relationship with Larry Fishman, and we keep pushing him to t take it to the next level. That came out, Lar that was really Larry's idea. He said, I'm really bugged by these people like Line 6 who model sound. Mm. He said, I don't want to do that, particularly with a Martin guitar. So what we started with was he said, take a D28, get it up to me, I'm going to put it in front of a good microphone, and then I'm going to massage that information, and then I'm going to capture it. And then when you make another D28 with that pickup system in it, you have the under the saddle pickup, so you get that volume, and we will blend in the microphonic sounds. Smart. So then I said to my colleagues, I said, okay, could we take a guitar from our museum and play it through antique microphones? Right. 
So now we can make you a reproduction of a guitar in our museum with that we can download that digital information of the sound of that vintage Martin from the museum played through a vintage microphone. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's if awesome. I can add this to it because I went through the, I went, not to plug Bose, but my wife bought me the Bose amplification system, uh -huh. which is the tower. Yep, yep, yep. I used to have a Fender acoustic amplifier okay. that had so much stuff on it. <laughs> And between the guitar <laughs> ability and the amplifier, I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. I was constantly going back to the guitar and putting it back to the factory setting. Yeah, yeah. The Bose doesn't have any of that fancy stuff. And now I'm able to just take yep. the guitar yep. and use it the way I think it was intended yeah. to. Yeah. Because you can get totally lost with the yep. electronics on the amp. I did a clinic with uh, Diane Ponzio, who predates pre Craig. And it was in Akron, Ohio. And the store there real focus was on high-end PA. And we did the clinic in the high-end PA room. I had never heard a Martin guitar sound that good. Wow. So, you know, what you, if you're looking for the ultimate, you need a really good guitar, you need a really good pickup, right. and you need a really good PA. Right. And then if it, all your ducks are in a row, and you have to know how to play it like right. Greg. <laughs> and playing, playing is the biggest thing. Like having a good player is always the thing. Like if yeah. people ask, you know, how do you get a good snare drum sound? Well, first you get a good snare drum, and then you get a good player. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty basic. It's yeah. you know, and that's kind of what it is. Mitch, uh, only because you uh, briefly mentioned it, uh, almost kind of jokingly. Uh, you said you don't really play guitar; you yeah. make guitars. Yeah. So it's kind of a two-part question: A, why'd you really never get into playing yeah. it? And B. Yeah. It, what type of experience did you have personally building guitars and how obviously now you run your business? Yep, how yep, many okay. You even build at this point, yep. but what experience did you have? Like your grandfather was obviously trained to do something. Yeah, yep, yep. What about you? So uh, my parents were divorced when I was three. My mom hated my dad and never encouraged me at all to pay any attention whatsoever to, to what? the Martin side. But I would come back in the summer and hang out with my grandparents because my dad was off getting remarried and re-divorced and or divorced and remarried and divorced and remarried and divorced. Um, I went to summer camp. I was telling this story earlier. went to summer camp and the, one of the counselors had a D18. And he would sit, we'd sit around the fire at night. And, and, and I'm, I'm, so I'm, what, 10? So that would have been 1965. So I'm, I'm becoming aware of like the Beatles. And I asked my father and grandfather for a guitar for Christmas. And I got a little 518, which I still have. It was nylon string, not steel string. And so my mom had arranged for me to have some lessons with a, a fellow who was a patient of my other grandfather, the doctor, in New Jersey. So I go to his studio in his home, the first lesson, and he re didn't really know who I was. And I, he, I think he was hoping to sell me a guitar because he had a music store. He said, oh, you've got a guitar. Yeah, i got a guitar. And I open up the case, and he's looking at the guitar. He's looking at me. He's looking at the guitar. He goes, that's a Martin guitar. I said, yes, it is. He said, uh, you don't know how to play. I said, nope, don't have a clue. He said, I've never had a young student who doesn't know how to play show up for their first lesson with a Martin guitar. I said, oh, my father owns the company. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So <laughs> now, in hindsight, what I realize is the light bulb in his head is I get to teach C.F. Martin how to play the guitar. So I'm thinking Beatles. Well, because it was a nylon string guitar, he pulls out a footstool. And he puts my foot on the footstool and he says, sit up straight and hold the guitar like this and put the thumb on the back of the neck. He did teach me to read. I, w I will give him credit. We went through Mel Bay 1 through 1000, but it never, it never really gelled. Uh, years later, another guitar that I had followed through the factory, my brother, may he rest in peace, borrowed, half-brother, went in his bedroom, closed the door, turned the radio on, and learned how to play the guitar. So as I was going through high school, I began to get interested. And one summer, I lived with my dad, which was interesting, the closest I ever got to him, and I followed a guitar through the factory. Did some work on it, but got to, and then uh, I went to college briefly in California. I came back and I worked in the factory, and I did a fast rotation. Some of the jobs I could do very well. You know what I say today, and, and, and I give Bob Taylor a lot of credit. He is a master luthier. Mr. Martin is dangerous with a chisel. So I work the front of the house. I'm the maitre d', right. and I got a bunch of good chefs in the back <laughs> cooking That's fine okay. meals. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I was just curious, you know, because yeah. you, you made a funny comment yeah. about that. So I got to see Jackson Brown, and he was playing a guitar, and I kept thinking, what the heck's he playing? So you guys did solid bodies. Why'd you stop? 
<laughs> Why did we start? That's a better question. I actually had a Martin bass. All right. A Martin electric bass. The maple ones or the yeah, mahogany the ones? Mahogany. Yeah, they were well made. They were sounding good. It's it's a very different world. Um, it's it's rock and roll, so it's very fashion forward, and there are some big formidable players out there who are not. It's their inclination not to be welcoming. And the products we made were, were more kind of, you could, we, we said, well, maybe country artists will play them. They didn't come in colors. They were not inexpensive. And honestly, back then, Fender and Gibson just kicked our butt around the block. And my feeling today is focus on acoustic guitars, focus on finding better ways to amplify the acoustic guitar sound, working with Fishman or Lord Bags or whoever. That keeps us busy enough. And if I were to distract my colleagues to, hey, let's chase electric guitars, folks like Bob Taylor would go, great, Chris is distracted. I don't want to give him that opportunity. <laughs> Good for you. Smart. Any other questions? Okay, Craig, would you mind leaving, leaving us with a nice song for? That would be awesome. Hold on. Straight up. Thank you very much, Chris Martin. My pleasure. And so ends another series of Montgomery hey. County Community College Master Classes. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it.